Good evening. Welcome to Good Friday here at First Presbyterian Church, Fullerton. Tonight, we step into that very dark and difficult day, that day where Christ gave his life for ours, a day of darkness. And you will hear the story read for you again, sung for you again, and spoken to your heart again as God's Spirit leads us this evening like to invite you to join me in our call to worship. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches 
and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. We worship you. unison reading tonight. We'll be using two verses of a hymn that's well known to many of you, and can it be. But tonight I want you to read it, to listen to it, and what it says to our lives this evening. Join me. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me, who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? He left his father's throne above. So free, so infinite his grace. Emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all immense and free, for, O oh my God, it found out me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amen.
Okay. Glad that you could come back to us, that we could come back to you. This is such an amazing experiment that we're working on and such creative and energetic people trying to make it all work. So let me, I don't know where you, I, you lost me. I lost you somewhere in there too. Let's return to our unison reading. Again from the, uh, the hymn, And Can It Be? Well, welcome back. We've been working very hard to try and fix all our technical difficulties, and we thank you for your patience. And know that uh, this grand experiment that we're about is never simple and never is easy in practice as it is in real life. So here we go again. We're going to go back to our unison reading from the hymn, And Can It Be?, and invite you to read it with me. And can it be? that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood. Died he for me, who caused his pain, for me, who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. 
His mercy all, immense and free. Oh, for oh my God, it found out me. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from John 18, verses 1 through 11. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? This is the word of the Lord. Sin to 
Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews could come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself, so they asked him, You aren't one of the disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. This is the word of the Lord. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. 
Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. 
The final scripture is from John 19, verses 17 through 22. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. From Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verses 44 and 45. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed. Darkness. It's the absence of light. Darkness can be dramatic, it can be scary. It can be poignant. It can speak to us of truth almost as much as light can. Darkness. Jesus died in the dark. And how ironic, for indeed, light was a characteristic by which Jesus was known. John, as he began his gospel, chapter 1, verse 4, said, In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Light, greater than the darkness of death and sin. How hard it must have been to keep that light alive, to let that light shine in all that darkness and all that pain that was poured out upon him that day. And then the sun stopped shining. But that light remained. That light, the light of Christ, continued in the darkness. John chapter 8, verse 12. Again Jesus spoke to them, saying, I and the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The light of life. He gave his life to take away the sins of the world that light might remain. Tonight, we have remembered the cost of darkness the pain of that Friday. For we cannot get to the hope of Sunday without this darkness. Hold on to the light. And in the new day, we will see our hope realized, born out of the darkness. We're going to have a closing song. And in that song, a spiritual I invite you to reflect again about what Jesus paid for you and to remember in silence the weight of his sacrifice. And when the song is over and the lights have gone, I encourage you to take time tonight to reflect on how deeply 
you are loved. Yeah. 
And he never said a mumbling word, not a word, not a word.